So, um, my, my purpose in pulling together this part of speakers was to introduce you to a couple of really eccentric personalities and their schemes and have you decide which ones would remain as pipe dreams and which ones might actually come to fruition. Daniel Kim was supposed to come here with his electric sheltered motorcycle with balanced technology that you could run off an iPhone. But he too has gone AWOL. He called me to say he had a real shot at major money with a major investor and he could only see him today. So I said, go get your money. And that brings me to Daryl Oster and his vacuum tube transporter. Now this idea has really got me excited because in a small way, when I was first building city TV and trying to escape the technology, the old-fashioned technology of the studio, I had this thought of moving the signals through the walls of the entire building so that we could shoot from anywhere. And I had been inspired that spring when I visited a department store in Paris, the old Printemps department store, which at that time still had an old-fashioned pneumatic canister system. Have any of you ever seen this? Yeah, they used to put the bills in them and then they go whooshing around this building and they'd get to the treasury or the cash register or something or other. I thought they were fascinating. And my crew take on Daryl's idea is that he's proposing to fire us from one end of the world to the other in a system roughly equivalent to that, right? We're talking about space travel on Earth. We're talking about New York to Beijing in two hours. Daryl, come and tell us about it. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. I'm here to tell you about the future of transportation. 10,000 years ago, North Americans tamed wolves so they could enjoy a better standard of living through transportation. And then the Spanish brought the horse. It was a gift from the gods, allowing double the standard of living, um, twice the speed, um, it, just a phenomenal advancement for early North Americans. And then in the early 1800s, steam power displaced muscle power. We, we had Fulton's Folly. Um, steamboats and steam trains. And then automobiles and aircraft displaced trains to niche markets because they offer far more value for most people. Transportation is the master key to survival. Without food and water, we perish. We've got to get to resources or resources have to be brought to us. So in an urbanized environment, we're far more dependent on transportation. We're 97% urbanized in North America. Transportation, unfortunately, depends on oil production that is being burnt faster than we can pull it out of the ground right now. We must have a new paradigm shift in transportation. What technology can do that? What can that technology can displace trains and cars and aircraft just like trains displace muscle power? Galileo observed that the earth is not the center of the universe. And during his 77 year life, when he observed the perpetual motion of the heavens and the orbits of the heavenly bodies as the foundation of science, he was probably the first person to realize that he was traveling through space at close to a million kilometers per hour and had been doing so his entire life. During his lifetime, he traveled almost a half a trillion kilometers through space. We are taking space travel conditions down to Earth. Evacuated tube transport stands for evacuated tube transport technologies. Those are the three Ts. Our global vision is being able to travel from here in Toronto up across Alaska, across the Bering Strait to Beijing in two hours for a hundred bucks round trip. Or cargo from any manufacturer in India or China to any Walmart in North America in four hours or less a pallet at a time minimum order so that ma and pa businesses can compete with, with Walmart. 
There are also people that say there are three T's that will hold us back from making that happen. One is they say that there are a lot of tyrants out there that represent the status quo that would be threatened by ET3 that might try to hold us back. We believe that ET3 offers tremendous profit potential for the status quo if they can see the glass as being half full instead of half empty. The other T is terrorism. There's a lot of people that say this will be a target for terrorists, and they don't believe us when we tell them that we believe this will be much safer than, and less immune to, um, more immune to terrorism than cars and aircraft and trains. But the third T that comes up all the time is toilets. <laughs> we were on a, uh, a, a flight across the Pacific, and a line formed in the toilet. There must have been something in the water or something of a half hour long to, to uh, use the toilet. It, it was not a fun situation. But cars can be directed to the nearest facility when, when needed. So they're not equipped this way. Evacuated tube transport is like a automobile, a car-sized vehicle that holds four, five, or six passengers in comfort, or up to three pallets of cargo, or this small Mopod road vehicle. It might even be able to be a flying car someday. This is a little, uh, if we can bring down the music a little bit, uh, this illustrates bringing space travel conditions down to Earth. There's no friction in space. So we're eliminating that friction by removing all the air from these tubes permanently, and these car-sized vehicles enter the evacuated environment through this airlock without letting any air into the system. So when this capsule enters the evacuated environment and the gate valve closes and seals, the remaining air can be removed. Then there's another pair of gate valves that open up, and it enters the evacuated environment, those gate valves close, so it doesn't let any air in. Now that lower chamber is evacuated, so it exchanges with the upper chamber to receive the inbound capsule. And then the capsule accelerates up to speed, just like a car merging onto the freeway. Once it gets up to speed, it merges into the flow and it can be routed anywhere in the network, like packets of information through the internet. This is the first generation prototype high temperature superconductor maglev. It's floating about this far off the track. And how it works is it takes superconductor elements, that's yttrium barium copper oxide, and when it's brought up down to liquid nitrogen temperature, about 200 degrees below zero, it levitates in the presence of a permanent magnetic field with no electricity, no electronics. That prototype that you saw us riding in in China will levitate for seven hours using only $3.50 worth of liquid nitrogen. Of course, in an evacuated environment, there's no air friction. This has air friction and it will eventually slow down. We're eliminating almost all friction from uh, um, travel. And then once the vehicle accelerates up to speed with the linear motor, like the, uh, um, the roller coaster rides, it accelerates up to speed, then it merges into the flow of traffic, it coasts for its entire trip using no additional energy, it can recover about 90% of that energy then when the vehicle slows back down. We can also achieve much, much higher capacities because um, we use a freeway philosophy and a car philosophy to apply magnetic levitation to instead of a train philosophy. So it does not interrupt the path of the vehicle. The vehicle can be routed anywhere in the network with um, passive elements on the track, and the vehicle controls the um, interchange, wh whether, wh what path it takes, instead of this physical moving switch like, that limits the frequency of a train to one train every five or six minutes. So we can achieve 10 times the capacity with ET3. This little girl was probably an expensive um, problem for her parents because back 100 years ago, in 1913, it took a whole room full of switchboard operators to switch phone calls. Um, everything was manual control. Now, on that same operator stool of 100 years ago, that little router can switch more data than a whole building full of operators. Google is in the process of automating transportation also. Three states now, the automated car is legal. We believe that it will be much easier to automate a vehicle operating in an enclosed, controlled environment instead of the chaotic environment um, where, where we've got problems with icy roads, um, cyclists pulling out in front of the vehicles, um, um, pets. 
and you know, probably all of us have, have lost a loved one or pets in a transportation-related fatality. This is the um, plane crash that uh, um, killed my mother-in-law. <clears throat> so, so um, who's had a blowout? Anybody have a blowout, a flat tire? It's really scary repairing that tire beside a fast-moving interstate highway. Um, it, it, it's a dangerous situation. Those permanent magnets for evacuated tube transport high-temperature superconductor maglev will re retain an estimated 90% of their field strength for, for 500 years. They're extremely permanent. Um, very little wearing surfaces, no, nothing, nothing to uh, go wrong, and automated maintenance for most of the processes. Who's ever been stuck in the middle seat? <laughs> There's no middle seats in a uh, $3 million uh, business yet. Um, it, it, it's uh, um, comfortable accommodations, first class comfort for six. This cockpit would fit inside of a standard um, capsule. Why not make the chairs this comfortable? Why not make the seats this comfortable? So we built a mock-up to um, see what we could do with, with uh, the comfort levels. This is my um, friend, and he's a licensee, Clyde Mann. He's a science teacher from um, Fremont, uh, California. And um, th this is the uh, capsule mock-up that we built. And because of uh, generous donations from parents and, and some companies there, we were able to, uh, for travel expenses, we were able to bring this to, so about 900, we call them tube blazers, we're able to uh, try out the ET3 capsule for comfort. Um, this is uh, Mayor Bill Harrison. He's a giant of a man. And Congressman um, Mike Honda is over at the uh, end there. And the reason he's celebrating like this is that I just entered, slipped up and introduced him as Senator um, Honda in instead of Congressman Honda. Uh, but Bill Harrison, Mayor, Mayor Harrison, said that this was the most comfortable seat that he had ever sat in compared to aircraft. It, it was night and day difference. He'd never experienced comfort in an aircraft. A hundred years ago, Henry Ford had to aggregate what would now be tens of billions of dollars to build a whole series of factories because there was insufficient capacity to build things back in Ford's day. Uh, um, uh, he had to build a factory to turn ore into iron and iron into, into uh, engine blocks, another factory to build gears and bearings. Everything had to be vertically integrated. It's amazing that it ever took place. Billions of dollars have already been invested in ET3. The companies that have made those investments just aren't aware of it yet. There is production capacity all over the world for making pipelines. Some of that capacity can be leveraged for ET3. There are approximately three million kilometers of pipelines in North America that are already moving more ton miles than trucks do, invisibly, and much less loss. Uh, this is a uh, LIGO observatory. It's evacuated to a million times higher quality vacuum than required for ET3, and it had no measurable leaks in a two-year period of time. If you uh, take one of these uh, roller coaster rides, hang on, because they're capable of four times the acceleration with linear electric motors than required for ET3. This is the first generation prototype high temperature superconductor maglev. In an evacuated environment, instead of 50 cents an hour cooling cost, it might only be 5 or 10 cents an hour cooling cost. If you could get from Toronto to Beijing in two hours, 10 cents cooling cost, about two and a half dollars worth of electrical cost and very little labor cost. Money is the most common man-made commodity in the world. It naturally seeks its greatest return and minimum risk. We are minimizing the risk by diversifying it over a lot of existing capacity that already exists in experts on our team. We're an open consortium model. This is Frank Davidson. He is the gentleman. Anybody know who he is? He had a crazy idea. He built a tunnel across the English Channel. He chaired the, founded the English Channel Tunnel Study Group and chaired that organization into the completion. He's on our board of advisors. This is a li a three licensees here. Um, Dr. Kamada is a physicist in Japan. Um, his wife, Yumi, is a CEO of a company that makes efficient products like uh, the LED light bulbs. And Brenda keeps everything at ET3 um, running very smoothly. Um, this is the inventor, Professor Wong, and his wife at, at Southwest Jiaotong University in uh, um, China, uh, where we spent four months 
Um, they're taking the ET3 technology and applying it to their maglev. They, they solve mutual problems. A couple of the PhD candidates here are now experts in the United States. Um, Jack Panner is a licensee who um, is a uh, retired Navy pilot and 747 pilot. And he has pulled together a team at Colorado School of Mines where, the, where there's over a dozen student teams that are working on ET3 related projects. The reason we can build ET3 for a tenth of the cost of high-speed rail is because those vehicles fully loaded with six passengers only weigh 550 kilograms, a little over a half a ton. Compare that to a, a, a train locomotive that weighs 100 tons, and you can see why it takes 1 35th of the amount of concrete and steel to build ET3 compared to those big hold, the, the structure to hold those big massive trains up. And ET3 can achieve 10 times the capacity of that train. And if we have to tunnel underground, the, uh, that little uh, green circle up there is a lot less dirt and rock remove th than the tunnel required for big maglev trains at those high speeds. Um, in uh, um, <laughs> the... the uh, Movement of cargo by air now, uh, most value of, of cargo goes by air, even though it's a small fraction of the tonnage. Of the uh, stuff that moves by container to retail outlets, over 90% of that ends up being brought home in cars, pickups, and SUVs. If we optimize the size of the vehicle, um, we, we quickly realize that it's already optimized by market force. Um, this shows it, it's in pounds um, in, instead of... Uh, um, world measure, but um, the average payload is about 400 kilograms, and the standard deviation is only 50 kilograms, and that includes about 50 kilograms worth of, of fuel load. So optimizing the size of the vehicle is very important. It's because if only if it's built to the same diameter standard in every country can eventually be networked together to achieve our vision. So um, the uh, uh, another possibility is couldn't a car like this be redesigned with retractable wheels so it could fit right into a capsule and then you'd have your vehicle when you get to your destination. Environmental aspects of ET3, we can achieve about 50 times more transportation per kilowatt hour of electrical energy or per unit of carbon production compared to electric cars or electric trains. And um, no runoff, um, no sound. Sound can't be transmitted in a vacuum. It'll be virtually silent. What we're doing is we're taking what we've learned by building prototypes and mock-ups uh, um, in, in China and elsewhere. We are looking for five kilometers where we can prove all the elements necessary for 600 kilometer per hour transportation. For instance, along a railroad right away. There are um, over a hundred and uh, or about 200,000 miles of un excuse me kilometers of unused railway right away in North America, and it's uh, there, there's a chance that a lot of that could be used for evacuated tubes. Unlike high-speed rail, if high-speed rail stops in every little town along the way between two major cities, it's no longer high-speed rail. Earthquakes are another uh, um, issue. We believe that uh, a lot of the uh, 300,000 kilometers of power line right away in North America can be, can be used for ET3 as well. And ET3, you can still farm under the, uh, the, the tubes. Our vision is bringing space travel conditions down to Earth so that everybody can enjoy them on a daily basis instead of just a few lucky astronauts. Want to go on a space vacation? Nobody? Nobody want to go on a space vacation? ET3 could bring that down to less than $1,000 the cost, but that's another story. Get involved with ET3, and, and we hope to uh, hear your suggestions on, on how we can bring this about further. Um, only if it's built to the same standard in every country can it eventually be networked together. Thank you. So, if I understand this correctly, the capsule is like a bullet, but there's no means of propulsion in the capsule. Where's the motor? The, the, the motor is on the acceleration tube um, leading into the main tube. It's a linear electric motor that turns on magnetic fields slightly in front of the vehicle when the, in a traction that attracts the vehicle forward. When the vehicle gets to that uh, a magnet, um, the field is reversed and it pushes, pushes. it away. 
So, so um, a whole series of those turned on and off um, in rapid succession um, can accelerate a, uh, a, a atomic particle up close to the speed of light in these linear accelerators. So what we're talking about is far less complex than that. And um, the, the uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Or not. I think it does. So the motor is not in the vehicle, Correct. it's in the tube. That's how we can make it so lightweight. Right. Now, 300 miles, did you say, an hour is not going to get you to Beijing in two hours. So Correct. Um, what is the top speed of your system if it were fully realized? Uh, at 6,500 kilometers per hour, 4,000 miles an hour, um, would uh, allow you to get from here up across Canada, across Alaska, across the Bering Strait to Beijing in about two hours. Um, <laughs> Why not? Um, and, and you said $100 a ticket? About 100 bucks round trip. Yeah, it'll, be, it'll drop to about a uh, little less than a tenth of the cost of flying. But what is the capital cost of a mile of your tube? About a tenth of the installed. cost of building high-speed rail. And um, right now, that's about $3 million a mile. $3 million bucks a mile. So to get from here to Beijing, the investment is? Oh, it, that'll, that'll take a... Um, Fair chunk of change. For, for the global backbone, will be much more expensive, too, because it'll have to be underground. Right. Um, so um, our, our plan is, if it's built to the same standard in, in every nation, above-ground infrastructure, um, and it'll take trillions of dollars of investment, but it can displace a $8.65 trillion per year industry spent on transportation, and we can displace about 90% of that eventually with maybe 10 or $20 trillion worth of investment. Here, here are some things I learned in doing my research. Um, it turns out trains are uh, a tenth as dangerous as flying, and flying is one-fifteenth as dangerous as cars, which are the leading cause of accidental death in North America probably in the world. So there's good safety reasons for doing this, but once you're in the tube, are we concerned about claustrophobia? Are we concerned, like, you can't see out, right? No windows. It, 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 it's a car-sized vehicle, and, and we can see out virtually with uh, high-definition cameras, cameras outside the tube or um, whatever visual input you want with your own personal touch screen in front of you or, or the new glasses that are coming, all, hmm. all kinds of wonderful stuff. So where will the prototype be located? Um, right now, uh, um, it, it appears that California is uh, California and Nevada. We have about three different locations that we're negotiating with now as far as where to put the first um, three miles, five kilometers, that, that can showcase all those elements necessary to network this on, on a regional basis at 600 kilometer per hour design speed, 375 miles yeah. an hour. So the last question is the feeder shot eventually blends into the main highway. Yes. So something regulates and spaces out these tubes as they shoot. Right. It's, just, it's like a freeway philosophy. So it's just like exits on a freeway can be added where they're needed according to demand and, and capacity, and never farther than 15-minute in increments. So the people are in control of their own vehicle where, where they can uh, leave the path of travel and get out and stretch their legs when they need to. And, and then continue on their trip. So on that 4,000 mile an hour backbone, 14,500 miles that connects uh, this area um, to Paris via Beijing and uh, New Delhi, um, it would take about four hours going the, the entire distance, or a little less. Um, th that uh, um, every 15 minutes would be 1,000 mile increments of accessibility on that main global backbone. Okay, last question, and this time I mean it. Your, your company, um, the thought is you will build the tubes, you will build the cars, you will run the transport company that sells the tickets. What, what is your vision? Our, our company is an open consortium that is creating a market for all the capacity to do those things that already exists. And um, that, that might increase the market for pipeline production capacity to 10 times what it is now, or vacuum pump making capacity to 10 times what it is now. So we can use parallel processes, unlike the serial for, uh, processes that Ford had to go through 100 years ago. All the capacity exists to do this now. And are these companies investing in you? 
Um, we're an open consortium. We're up to 244 licensees in 19 countries. Those consist of individual experts, um, companies, and institutions. And we hope eventually governments. Wow. To leverage the trillions know, of dollars of right away that are. I know exists. that there are a couple of venture capitalists out there, so perhaps they'll be approaching you at the break. Thanks so much, Darren. Oh, thank you very much, Mike.